Welcome to the Sacred Stream radio podcast, brought to you by the Foundation of the Sacred Stream and Red Cow Productions. Today, my guest is Julie Lewis, author of the new book, Still Positive, a memoir. Julie is a 30-year HIV survivor, and the book tells her fascinating and inspiring story. She's also the mother of multi-Grammy winner Brian Lewis of Macklemore and Ryan Lewis, and with his encouragement, she founded the 3030 Project, a nonprofit whose mission is to bring access to quality, affordable health care to those who need it most. In today's episode, I talk with Julie about her diagnosis of HIV early in the AIDS epidemic, which she received from a blood transfusion, the impact of it on her and her family's lives, her concerns as a mother raising three young children, and the prejudice she faced early on because of the lack of understanding and fear surrounding the disease. Julie became an early advocate and educator about AIDS, bringing awareness to communities and helping many people. We also talk about her impressive accomplishment with the 3030 Project, which she founded to celebrate having survived HIV for 30 years. The goal of building 30 medical facilities in areas throughout the world where the need was greatest was impressively accomplished in just five years with the help of many organizations, including Construction for Change. Julie's remarkable story is, at its heart, a mom's story of love, hope, courage, and defying the odds. And I'm very happy to share it with you here. I'm Laura Chandler, and my guest today is Julie Lewis, author of Still Positive, a memoir. In 1990, Julie was diagnosed with HIV and given three to five years to live. This book is her story of finding her voice, finding her community, becoming an advocate, and living with HIV for what is now 39 years and counting. Welcome, Julie. Thanks for having me, Laura. When you were diagnosed in 1990, it was the early days of the AIDS epidemic. It was. It was a time filled with misunderstanding, stigmatization, fear, and silence. Um, Can we start by talking about how you contracted HIV and how you found out about this diagnosis? Um, Well, I contracted HIV in 1984, um, when my oldest daughter, who's almost 40 now, <laughs> uh, was born, I hemorrhaged for 12 hours after giving birth. And so I, um, the day after she was born, I, was, I received um, three units of blood to replace the blood I lost. <laughs> and um, I mean, at that point, nobody said this was a risk and nobody, you know, it just, wasn't on anybody's radar, even though it was widely known that HIV was in the blood supply. Mm -hmm. Um, And anyway, I I began having symptoms in 1989 and 88, and I have all these symptoms, I'm really exhausted. And at that point, I'd had three kids in four years. So, (laughs) you know, like, it's like, um, so every doctor was like, well, you have all those little kids. Of course you're tired, you know, and they'd run tests, but nothing came back. So in 1990, I actually got a phone call from uh, the doctor who had delivered my daughter. Mm-hmm. And then he said, you know, the blood bank has gotten a hold of me. And one of the people who gave you blood has AIDS. And so, you know, we're suggesting that you go get an HIV test. And in that moment, I just knew I had HIV because I'd had all of these um, symptoms with no explanation whatsoever. Um, so that's how I found out. Mm-hmm. Um, I, after I found out, I had, we had to get every person in our family tested for HIV because um, my daughter, my oldest daughter was born before um, I had the transfusion, but I had breastfed her. So she had a small chance of being infected. And then I had two other kids in that time um, who were born to an HIV positive mom. Mm -hmm. 
and they had about a 25% chance of being infected. And then my husband and I, I mean, if you're pregnant, you're not using condoms. Right. <laughs> but, you know, almost that whole time. And then he, he had a vasectomy. So that was a six and a half years um, that he could have gotten infected. And yeah. he was, um, you know, the good news was none of them were. So, I mean, that is amazing, you know, that... And, and also what a conundrum, you know, for you to be happy that you were the only one who has contracted yeah. this. What a, what yeah, a... Many people, you know, getting a diagnosis like that's the worst day of their life. Yeah. And, you know, my best day of my life was finding out that the rest of my family was not infected. Um, yeah. Not that it wasn't, you know, didn't turn into like a whole book of like, <laughs> crazy stuff but um yeah. it just could have been so much worse for us so you know yeah. i've always been grateful yeah yeah you know and those early days i mean that we were i'm like oh my gosh if ryan came home over and said he and laura were going to die in a couple of years i would be beyond devastated so it's interesting how we perceive things from our own space you know especially in a crisis so yes yes and, you know, I'm struck by so many things that you write about and just staying with the early, in the early days, just to start, this idea that they did know about the blood supply. They, they knew in, eight, I think it was like 1980, 1981. So yeah. there was this big ball drop that the health community just wasn't up to speed where they should have been about money really yeah <laughs> you yeah. know yeah, yeah. and about fear i yeah. mean i i got this i mean COVID had a little bit of this this oh, was like a little sure. bit of a flashback yeah but um you know the blood the book banks are businesses right yeah and um and they were just going with what the centers for disease control and the national institute of health has had put out as mm -hmm. their you know sort of standard procedures yeah. and until those were changed um the fear of losing donors in blood banks the fear of lawsuits all these things mm -hmm. uh, you know it's a business yeah. and they have actuaries doing the math of like what's going to cost you right. <laughs> you know the giant corporations of insurance people and stuff but i didn't know any of that i mean i've really just research and I have several friends who are hemophiliacs who either died or have HIV mm -hmm. and they had a whole different you know but similar uh, struggle with um, the companies producing factor eight which is um, the blood clotting factor they have to take mm -hmm. so you know it, it was an interest there was an interesting sideshow going on um, yeah with Reagan administration with mm -hmm. The blood banks, you know, these are all businesses. Yeah. Uh, there was just a lot of misinformation and a lot of fear and a lot of judgment around this disease. So, yeah, yeah it, was a, it, it wasn't like, um, I, I can't hardly think of another disease <laughs> that ran the gamut of this, but COVID came close. I mean, just to yeah. get political and uh, there was fear, you know, and, and judgment. So yeah. um, it was kind of weird yeah too. and the unknown you know this big and unknown. The unknown and the fear of infecting people I and mean, there was mm -hmm. just a lot happening there that was a little yeah. bit of a trauma <laughs> trigger for me <laughs> yeah yeah gosh I could imagine so many people were infected through transfusions but it was more thought of as the gay man's disease early on, especially, and you know, drug addicts or something, you know, sharing needles or something like that. And so, how did you navigate that? I mean, for four years, we didn't really tell hardly anyone yeah. because, um, you know, my kids were two, four, and six years old. And literally, the week <clears> I was diagnosed, <throat> moved uh, to a city five hours away from Seattle mm -hmm. um, that was very conservative. Um, and my husband was in full-time Christian ministry, uh, which was very conservative and judgmental. Oh, yeah. And I just, I, you know, I, I just, my whole being just wanted to protect my children. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, the first time my, my oldest was in first grade, and 
Washington has a pretty, Washington state has a pretty stringent HIV AIDS education in the schools. And um, so one of the first weeks of school, they had this event for parents that they could come and learn about the HIV mandatory education, not just for first grade, or they started actually in fourth grade, mm -hmm. but for um, all grades. And as a health teacher, I was super interested, but also, you know, I was living with this secretly. Mm -hmm. So I went and um, it all went normal. It was like they could mm -hmm. have been talking about social studies. Yeah. Uh, with a nurse and a person from the district. And then at the end, this guy raises his hand and he stands up and he's like, well, I'm a medical doctor mm -hmm. and I don't believe what the CDC and the National Institute of Health are saying. I think there's many ways this disease is spread. Right. I'm in the back and I'm just going, okay, I'm not telling anybody this. Like, right. like if I had thought for a moment of sharing this with anyone, did that just nipped it in the bud? Because, you know, I just didn't want people not allowing their kids to come to our house um, be, to play or yeah. be afraid of our family. So for four years, we just um, told very, very few people. Um, even some of my best friends, if I didn't think I could trust them with a secret, because not everybody's good mm -hmm. with a secret. Right, right. I, didn't, I just yeah. didn't tell them, so I lied a lot. I was sick right. a lot, and I just made up stuff, you know. Yeah. People asked why, so. Yeah, and it's understandable. I mean, again, you know, thinking back to those early, the early 90s, I mean, boy, there was, it, it was still not where, yeah. you know, still wasn't understood. But after that, to continue the answer yeah. to that question, yeah. um, when we did, did tell our kids uh, yeah. four years later, and, you know, you tell a six-year-old your private information, <laughs> yeah. and it's pretty much public. Like, yes. they don't, you know, I said, this isn't a secret. Yeah. It's yours. You, you know, it's private information. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I didn't want her to feel like they were in trouble yeah. if they told someone or was it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I immediately, because I'm, I'm an educator, um, and at this point I'm a public health educator, I joined a speaker's bureau because I had lived mm -hmm. four years with these misconceptions mm -hmm. and I just had a real strong belief that education and meeting people who are actually dealing with something um, changes people. Yeah. And so I was on a speaker's bureau with about 15 other HIV positive people and actually went to work at the health department mm -hmm. in blood path pathogen work yeah. uh, then for the next 10 years. So, yeah. um, so that's, that was my public response, but yeah. for several years, we did, we really did it. It's totally understandable. You, you need to control the narrative, especially when you have young kids and you're trying to figure things out and people are kind of a little bit crazy out there, you know? A <laughs> little <laughs> 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 strange, but you know, it, 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 it's a very poignant moment in the book when you tell your kids. And I, I wonder if you can just speak a moment about like what, what made that change from the silence to, okay, now, now I want to talk about it. Um, well, at that point, my kids were six, eight and 10 and my 10 year old Teresa had gone through the HIV AIDS education, which, um, is at the very end of the year. Um, mm -hmm. I used to teach sex education to high school kids and I waited to the very end of the year. You want her to be as mature as possible. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So HIV uh, education is sort of similar. It's yeah. in May. And uh, so, you know, I was literally on my bed. My, she was sitting on my bed, and I was sitting there putting my earrings on, getting ready for work. And she says to me, how did your friend Mary die of AIDS? Because it was another family that we had met. And, mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't, you know, I hadn't lied to my kids, really. Yeah. I, and she was very sick and died. And so I said, you know, Mary had died of AIDS. And then she said, I said, well, Mary had a blood transfusion. That's mm -hmm. how she died of AIDS. That's how she got it. And then <laughs> Teresa looked at me with this God awful face and she goes, mom. And I was like, what? She goes, well, you had a blood transfusion. And I was literally like, crap. <laughs> right. They're so smart. <laughs> 
could you have AIDS? And I was like, well, I could. And then she said, do you? And I just went, nope, don't have AIDS, go to school. I was just not prepared. Yeah. Plus I only had an HIV positive, you know, diagnosis. I actually didn't have an AIDS diagnosis, yeah. which is pointless. I was totally <laughs> lying to her. Yeah. And then, you know, Scott came home and I just said, uh, there, you know, Chris is asking, like, I would feel terrible for her to find this out from someone else, Yeah, you know, and know that I lied to her, right? So we waited till school was out um, in June, mm -hmm. and then, um, and then told them each separately, mm -hmm. because uh, they were just at some such different points in development. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then it was out there, I mean, you know, and you, you you tell a really some funny story, you know. But it, your youngest, I think Ryan was six, and Ryan was six. Oh, my Albertsons. Yeah, yes, yeah. So, yeah. Well, we we spent the summer um, at a, at a um, at a camp for high school kids that my husband works at in the summer. Mm -hmm. and that was another reason why I wanted to tell him then because we were going for Columbia for a while mm -hmm. and, I, and I just wanted them to get away from their friends so they could process it. Um, but anyway, everything yeah. seemed a little normal. Yeah. And then uh, when we got back, we were in the grocery store checking out and Ryan looks at the checker and looks at me and he goes, does she know you have AIDS? And I was like, well, she doesn't. <laughs> She was just like kind of trying to disappear, you know. Yeah. And, um, I mean, this is 1994, right? Yeah. And and, and I was, it was kind of comic relief, to be honest. It yeah. was like, well, there we go. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Several things like that happened. Yeah, I'm I'm sure with a six-year-old. <laughs> You're listening to the Sacred Stream radio podcast with my guest, Julie Lewis, author of the memoir, Still Positive. This book is so filled with information and stories and I really encourage people to read it. It's a beautiful cover, and I love the title, Still Positive, because you're very positive in such so many good ways. And I imagine that is also part of how you've maintained. And I want to ask you, how, how do you deal with this intense uh, diagnosis? I mean, it's been a long time. So um, mm -hmm. I think I've gone through phases mm -hmm. of healing. Um, and, you know, at this point, I mean, it is not a fatal disease. The mm -hmm. medicines are incredible. Mm -hmm. um, they're making them easier and easier to take and adhere to. Um, and, you know, the goal with the medicines is to have a non-detectable viral um, that the virus is non-detectable in yeah. our system. It doesn't mean it's gone. It just mm -hmm. means the test can't detect it. Mm -hmm. And um, if that's the case, you can't transmit the virus. Um, wow. That like undetectable, undetectable equals um, that you can't transmit it. So mm -hmm. it's kind of an exciting time because people can just live a normal life. Like yeah. someone with HIV today sh that just gets diagnosed should have a normal lifespan. Mm -hmm. The bad news is what has not changed is the stigma and the yeah. discrimination. Um, in fact, I, I would say it's gotten worse in the last few years. But over the years, the more you became a long-term survivor, I mean, I still have friends who are dying yeah. um, because our systems, I mean, I've been taking medication. I've taken over 60,000 pills wow. to stay alive. I mean, it's, it's a lot for your body mm -hmm. um, to process. And so those early years, I spent a lot of time, I would say, on that grief scale. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I got stuck on just denial for a very long time. It just felt like, you know, I would say things to my kids like, well, when I'm, you know, your kid's grandma, knowing I probably would never be their kid's grandma. But I felt mm -hmm. like talking about it was better than nothing at all, right? Yeah. It felt like just sitting around waiting to die is such a terrible way to live. Yeah. And so 
I would just talk about the future like there was going to be a future, um, even though the chances of that wasn't high, right? Mm -hmm. And and I try not to be a, a sad mom, you know, because I don't want my kids to remember me as a sad mom, you know, mm -hmm. like, and I wanted them to have as much normal of life as possible. So. Um, other than when I spoke on the speakers bureau, I didn't, I didn't talk a lot about it yeah. at dinner parties or anything. I just wanted to live as much like everyone else, um, as I could mm -hmm. at the same time, I am literally writing letters to my kids adult self like yeah. i am writing letters for them to read when they're adults because mm -hmm. i know if i die in three years ryan won't even have started kindergarten and he's going to remember me a little but as a mom you know mm -hmm. of a little kid and so yeah. it was this weird balance of you know denial and acceptance mm -hmm. back and forth <laughs> and then just trying to get the most out of the days that i yeah. And then as my friends died, I, um, I actually, um, became the foster parent of one of their kids. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and the kid, my adult, I'm um, not adult, my teenage kids joined mm -hmm. the speakers bureau and, and were the most popular, uh, speakers because they were peer educators. Right. Yeah. So there was that whole phase and I just, um, and then, and then, you know, in the third part of my book, my yep. kids actually become young adults and adults and mm -hmm. kind of set my mind on if I could change one thing in the world, it, you know, it would be that. So mm -hmm. that's what I just really started advocating. Yeah. And I guess now I'm just an older person. And so <laughs> it's hard to say what's causing all of my health problems. <laughs> 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 you know? When you have high blood pressure and high cholesterol with the rest of the, uh, you know, adult population that's over 50, right. it's like, um, it's just hard to know. So I just try to, I just try to do the things you learned in fifth grade in health class, you know, mm -hmm. walk you know, sleep good. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, you, you've done so much in your life and are continuing to do so much. And I just, you know, you mentioned the Speakers Bureau and that seems to be the time when you really stepped out into becoming an advocate, finding your voice and really helping other people who were dealing with it. And that, that was so important and uh, such an important contribution that you made and also how you grew. And now your book, all of the funds go towards the 3030 Project Legacy Fund. And I want to talk about the 3030 Project. And also I want to talk about Construction for Change, because that's how you sort of moved from your advocacy with the Speakers Bureau to this whole new phase in your life that's done so much good in the world. Well, do you want to know how I got involved with Construction? Construction for change. Sure. Really, you know, when I moved back to Seattle 20 yeah. years ago um, from uh, the east side of the state, mm -hmm. I was I had been like working for the health department for so long, and mm -hmm. I was that woman who went into all the high school mm -hmm. and college classes and had that scary STD. Um, STI or STD slides you know, mm -hmm. that I would show and talk about, you know, preventing uh, sexually transmitted diseases. And I talked mm -hmm. about HIV. And I mean, I remember being um, in Idaho at Priest Lake in a bar and the bartender looks at me and he goes, aren't you that lady that came into my high school a few years ago and showed me? <laughs> <laughs> moment I was like yeah and so when we moved to Seattle yeah I just felt like I just want to do something else I feel like I have done all this advocacy and this work on you know HIV HIV you know justice and I just I thought to myself I feel like I did jury duty and there's other mm -hmm. people who are younger than me now and probably more effective at this I just want to do something else Mm -hmm. And so I went to work for a really big uh, nonprofit, uh, like uh, 
budget in the billions nonprofit. Wow. Mm -hmm. And it was just so, um, I mean, they do good work, but it was just so hard to get anything done because you had to go through all these layers and all these forms and get approval. You know, it was a huge organization. So I was, um, I was with some college kids because I was mentoring college kids at the time. Mm -hmm. Said I was just always bitching about my job, and I said, I just, I just want to work for a small nonprofit where if you want to get something done, you can just do it. <laughs> and one, uh, one of the women there said, Oh, my brother-in-law has an organization like that. It's called Construction for Change, and I was like. I know nothing about building. <laughs> <laughs> and the next week he called me yeah. and he said, I really want you to come to work for us. And I said, oh, you don't want me building anything. He goes, no, no, <laughs> I just want to vet our projects. We, we have so many applications and we need someone to go through and investigate these um, organizations and see if they really need a building and if they can sustain it and all this stuff. So. So my co-author, Ginny Koenig, and mm -hmm. I, uh, years ago, like probably, I don't know, 15 years ago, mm -hmm. um, I called her uh, and I said, and she's, you know, young. She's my daughter, Teresa's age. And I said, I have this job offer, but I don't want to do it by myself. Do you want a job share with me? And she said, mm -hmm. yes. And so they don't typically build housing. They build uh, community buildings. Mm -hmm. um, not that housing isn't something that's needed. They yeah. just build these these larger community buildings. So anyway, um, so in 2014, so Jenny and I did that for three or four years. And then in 2014, it was my 30th anniversary. I'm going to just go right into the 30th anniversary. And I want you to do that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This is the they're, connect, they're very connected. Yeah. So I told them, you know, if we could think of a pay it forward project, that we could do in honor of our friends that died, I'd be up for that. Mm -hmm. And um, and then in one of my like you know brainstorm moments, I said I said to them, you know, we could raise money to build one healthcare facility somewhere in the world that lasts healthcare access, and have CFC build it for mm -hmm. us. <laughs> um, and then Ryan, um, who if we haven't said this yet, is Ryan Lewis from Macklemore and Ryan Lewis, you know, had just won four Grammys. It was kind of at the top of his, um, you know, he was 25 and yeah. thought he could do anything. Like he would say this. <laughs> and this is your son. Yeah. He does amazing things, but yeah. Yeah. he was super optimistic at the time. And he said, mom, you've lived 30 years. We can't just build one. We need to build 30. And I just looked at him like, nice. Ryan, 30 yeah. is so many more than one building. Um, yeah. But somehow he talked me into this. And um, so we had an Indiegogo campaign. And the, he, um, he and his friend made this really strong video. And we got on, uh, and we launched the 3030 project with the goal to, thir to build to raise money to build 30 healthcare facilities around the world in areas that lack healthcare access. Mm -hmm. And that, um, and CFC was actually our umbrella organization. We didn't start a, a new nonprofit. We were umbrellaed under the Construction for Change label. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we got a ton of support from mm -hmm. um, Ben and Ryan, um, Ben Haggerty is Macmore. And, um, they added a dollar per ticket through the plus one campaign um, right. to all of their tours. So they alone probably funded three, three medical facilities. Wow. And then that Indiegogo campaign funded three. Yeah. Um, but I mean, and we were on a lot of national talk shows. We got a lot of attention. I could mm -hmm. not have done this without them. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, after a few months, they went back to their jobs and <laughs> they went back to what they already do. And one morning I just woke up and it was like me with this huge goal. And I was pretty panicked. Yeah. Um, so that's when I just started speaking again a mm -hmm. lot um, mm -hmm. about the idea that healthcare spaces could create healthcare access. Mm -hmm. And it was real slow going. It was a five year project. Mm -hmm. um, it started in 2014 and we raised the money by 2019. Wow. But we were way behind our goal for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and 
I, we hired a team of women, uh, a small team of women. Mm -hmm. and the smartest thing we did was hire a woman who did measurement and evaluation. Mm -hmm. So we started measuring um, very specific things in our new buildings. And, and it really came to be that that, that information, that, that data, mm -hmm kind of proved that healthcare spaces were creating healthcare access. And once yeah. we had that hard data, mm -hmm. the last years of funding came in pretty quickly. Um, we both got corporate funding and, and a lot of individual funding. So, Amazing. Uh, and then we just, um, I just sent off the last 50 grand in that account. We are at the end of our building. Uh, we're building our last building for the 3030 project. We had a couple building delays during COVID, but, yeah. um, but it's almost fully, you know, it's almost fully done, the actual buildings. So pretty exciting. That's amazing. What an accomplishment. Yeah, we ended up building 30 buildings for 18 organizations in nine countries. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's amazing. And, you know, I, I'm inclined to say, so what's next? Although <laughs> that was a lot. Was you did like a vacation, maybe? <laughs> I don't know if I know how to do that. I, my husband and I were so funny. We're you know working in our mid sixties, and I, yeah. all our friends are retiring. And I just oh, one day I looked at him and I go, I don't even like to golf. What are we going to do? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, we we both like working, mm -hmm. so I don't know what we're going to do when yeah. you just can't do it anymore. But um, yeah, I I appreciate people who retire and just have all these hobbies and things. But yeah. I didn't prepare myself for. <laughs> Um, I'm doing what's called, what I call a reorg of my life yeah. uh, right now. You know, companies do that where they like look at what the structure is yeah. and then restructure. I feel like I'm doing that right now since the book's um, out. Mm -hmm. And someone said to me, uh, you're Marie Kondo in your life. I said, I kind of am. I'm taking all these things I do and I'm holding it in my hand and looking at them and going, does this give me any life or not? If not, I'm going to get rid of it. That's great. Yeah. Well, it's easier said than done, let me tell you. Yeah, I, I'm sure. Well, you know, maybe building healthcare facilities and, and raising awareness is a hobby for you, as no, well as it. A... That is exhausting. Like, no. I'm glad we finished, but I don't think I have it in me to take on that big of, I mean, it was a lot. I, I, uh, yeah. It, it, I mean, impressive. Remodeling your kitchen. That's a lot. <laughs> now think of building whole buildings 30 of in them. nine different countries with nine different rules and yeah. uh, governments change while you're doing it. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a lot. And it's that, huge. Construction for change is amazing. And they continue to build healthcare buildings mm -hmm. and other buildings. And um, yeah, I, I actually r raise money for them still um, mm -hmm. because I just believe in what they're doing so much. Uh, you yeah. know, you have these great organizations, but they don't do anything in those buildings. You just, you have these great or organizations and even governmental agencies yeah. who are doing great work, but nobody knows how to build a building. And, right. and so they'll have a capital campaign and they'll take away time from their actual critical services mm -hmm. for the building. And what CFC does is they come in and they manage all that with yeah. their expertise and they bring in pro bono architects and all mm -hmm. kinds of things that save people money. So, so such um, great work. Such I'm great a work. big, big fan yeah. of Instructor for Change and what they do. Yeah. Well, Julie, I, I'm a big fan of you and your book. And I want to say that it's a really important documentation and contribution to the story of what has been this epidemic in our country. And I, I just can't say enough about how important it is. And we've just scratched the surface. There's so much information in there and so many stories and people are going to really learn a lot. And, um, and it's a it's an easy, easy read and a great read. So I just... Okay. You know, I mean, at its core, the book is a mom story, you know, yeah. and there aren't a lot of HIV stories about families and moms. Yeah. And, um, and there were a lot of us moms out there yeah. you know, dealing, dealing with being sick in those days and yeah. trying to figure out how to care for our families and our kids. So, um, well, so thanks for yeah. having me on. And um, yeah, I hope people do read the book. Yeah, well, thank you for taking the time to be here. The book is still positive. Julie Lewis, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Laura.
Thanks for listening to the Sacred Stream radio podcast. My guest has been Julie Lewis, author of Still Positive, the story of her life as a mom, advocate, and 30-year HIV survivor. You can learn more about Julie, her book, and her nonprofit at stillpositive.com and the3030project.org. The Sacred Stream radio podcast is brought to you by the Foundation of the Sacred Stream and Red Cow Productions. You can download or subscribe to this podcast anywhere you get your podcasts or stream it on our website, sacredstream.org. You can also watch the podcast on the Sacred Stream YouTube channel. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a comment. It's a very easy way for you to show your support and to help us reach more listeners. We're a nonprofit organization dedicated to supporting consciousness on the planet and making programs like this one widely available and free. If you'd like to support this podcast with a donation, you can do so on the website. It really helps, and we really appreciate it. Big thanks to the folks who helped make this podcast happen. Cody Humston, Clementine Moss, Katie Healy, Sherry Serino, and John Grubbs. I'd also like to thank our friends at Leadership Landing, Riverine, Ideas with Impact, and Zoo Labs. And thank you for listening. I hope you'll join me again next time in the stream.